Okay, so this final section of uh, the part one of the discourse on inequality, uh, and in this final, uh, you know, third or so of, of part one, uh, Rousseau really kind of makes a, a series of interrelated arguments, wants to make a series of interrelated claims, broad points about humanity and the state of nature. Um, one of them is that uh, people in the state of nature were totally isolated, totally asocial, had no natural connection to each other what whatsoever, other than the very brief, very sort of casual, uh, and again, just completely brief uh, union for, for sexual intercourse. That's, that's the one kind of natural bond that people have, but it's very temporary. He doesn't think that the family existed naturally. There is some natural connection between mother and child, but he says once the child is old enough, to go off and get its own food. It wanders off and does that, and that's the end of the, of the family. So very, very brief uh, coupling, and then relatively brief, certainly compared to, in civil, uh, th compared to the situation in civilization, a relatively brief family life, which is just mother and child. Uh, but for the most part, he says, people are totally isolated in the state of nature. So that's one thing. They're asocial. They, they, they really don't connect at all. They really don't come together for any reason. People are naturally uh, uh, I individuals. They're, 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 they're naturally sort of isolated, not connected, not social at all. Also, he says naturally they have really no mental endowment at all, or, or again, not, not none at all, but a very, 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 very uh, slight mental endowment, no real capacity for language, no real capacity for any kind of abstract thought. Uh, and then finally, he wants to say that naturally human beings are basically, again, as, as we saw in the, uh, uh, in the preface especially, that human beings have a kind of natural pity a natural, uh, even a kind of natural gentleness, so long as, as their own, uh, their own self-preservation doesn't require them to be harsh or, or, or violent or anything. Um, and these, these three things are actually all related, because if human beings are naturally uh, isolated, independent, in other words, free, they're completely naturally free because they, they don't really need anything from one another. Uh, again, maybe a child needs to be taken care of by its mother for a little while, but then very soon it can wander off and take care of itself. So if human beings are naturally free, then they have no necessary, no inherent connection to anybody else, and therefore no dependence on anybody else. So human beings are naturally free, he says, and that's, that's part of what makes them naturally compassionate or, or, or uh, even gentle. Because if they're naturally free, if they don't rely on or, or depend on anybody else, then they have no reason to be cruel to anybody else. They have no reason to be cruel to get anything from that person. And since they're naturally free, they, they don't need to be cruel to other people. They don't need to dominate other people to somehow compensate themselves for, for, for the loss of their natural freedom. And because they, they naturally have very little intellectual capacity, uh, they, they, have no, they, they have no real sense of self. And therefore, if there is some kind of a conflict over something, uh, he says it's very brief, and then once it's over, it's over. And, and no one has a sense of self to be offended. They may suffer an injury, but they never take that injury as some kind of a personal offense. Therefore, once, once this brief conflict over a piece of food, for instance, once it's over, one person eats, the other person wanders off, and th th in no way do they feel uh, humiliated or embarrassed or personally insulted. They don't feel any need to take revenge because of, because of pride, because Rousseau says, in the state of nature, pride does not exist. And again, a big part of that is because the human mind is not developed enough to, to conceive of, of the self, uh, to conceive of a, of, of a sense of pride at all. Um, so these, these three points are connected. The most important one in many way for, ways for Rousseau is arguing that human beings are not naturally violent, not naturally cruel or destructive. Uh, he, he mentions Hobbes in particular, uh, but of course that could also be a common view that people outside of civilization uh, are actually, you know, violent or, or, or people, you know, savages, again, savages in, in, in the negative sense. People who are living in, in, in uh, societies and so on that, that haven't really been developed yet, the idea is that they would therefore be morally inferior to people living in, in societies, in, in more developed societies, living in civilization. Uh, and Rousseau argues against that, and he argues against that in several ways, in several different places, but this is clearly not his, not, not his view. So in arguing that human beings are naturally uh, compassionate, naturally even kind of uh, uh, gentle, and, and that, that they hate to see other things, and especially other human beings suffer, uh, and that they are in a sense morally superior to civilized human beings, he's not only arguing against Hobbes, he's also arguing against a kind of 
more uh, general view of uncivilized humanity as somehow being more savage, more brutal, more violent, and just generally morally worse. Okay, and again, he says actually they're better for various reasons. Part of it just being that that, that, that their minds are not developed enough to conceive of all kinds of things that that, that might a, that, that might agitate their souls and their passions and therefore make them violent. Uh, and and since their minds aren't developed, again, therefore their passions are relatively simple. And when the passions are relatively simple, they're easily satisfied, and there's very little reason for conflict. So, how does he actually develop this argument throughout this section? Let's let's look at some high points. Um, so he basically says, you know, savage man, again, savage man just meaning human beings uh, in a kind of pre-civilized state. Uh, obviously, uh, when, when we call people savages, just as in Rousseau's day, oftentimes that, that can be negative. It, it suggests that maybe, again, that they're violent, that they're, that they're savage in a kind of cruel or, or murderous way. And Rousseau, again, rejects all of that. When he says savage man, he just means, you know, pre-civilized man. Uh, human beings living in the most basic kind of in, in the in the most basic uh, at, at the most basic level of, of human development. So living together in some kind of society, but not 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 in any kind of uh, advanced society. Of course, for Rousseau, the crucial turning point was the institution of private property. So when he talks about savage man, when he uses examples from contemporary travelers and so on, what they've seen that's that's what he's talking about. Obviously, not violent people. People living in in a, in a kind of social order, but one that is relatively undeveloped, uh, relatively primitive. Again, these are good things for Rousseau, and in particular, not 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 characterized by private property and law and all the things that that, that come from that. Um, so he says, you know, savage man, natural humanity begins with only animal perceiving and feeling, very simple willing, very simple rejecting. Uh, and he says, you know, that, so that's that's what natural humanity begins with. There's obviously perception; people feel things, and then there's very simple desire for something and, and aversion or, or rejection of something else. Um, someone's hungry; they they desire food. They start to eat a piece of fruit that's rotten. They spit it out. They reject it. It's not good. Uh, so he says, you know, that's this very simple animal perceiving, animal feeling, animal willing and rejecting. And he says the, 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 the condition of, of natural humanity has to change before human beings can actually develop mentally or emotionally, before they can be anything more complicated than basically just animals who have this very simple sense of perception, and this very simple sense of, again, desire or aversion. He says, thinking is really dependent on feeling. For human beings to develop intellectually, for them to develop in terms of thinking, they have to develop in some ways uh, in terms of emotion. As he puts it, we seek to know only because we desire to enjoy. So why do our minds develop? Why do we think simply to know how to enjoy something? Uh, and therefore, thinking is dependent on feeling because we're not going to bother to think about something if we don't have a desire for it. So, so thinking is, is kind of dependent on the, the, the feeling of, of, of desire, the feeling of wanting something, and then we think about it to figure out how to get it. But at the same time, uh, he also says feeling is dependent on thinking. Uh, so as he puts it, one can desire or fear a thing only if one has an idea of it in the mind. Uh, so again, natural humanity, if, natural, if, if, if a human being in the state of nature uh, wants a piece of fruit and, and the piece of fruit is on a high tree and they, they can't reach it, then they think, wh what do they think? They, they pick up a rock and throw it and knock the fruit down. Uh, so why have they thought about how to do that? Because they want, it, want to eat the fruit. But he says also feeling is dependent on thinking because if you have no concept of something in your mind, you can't possibly desire it. So human beings in the state of nature have no concept of, say, luxury. So they, so they, they of course don't desire luxury because they don't even know what it is. That, that they don't have words at all, and the word luxury, like every other word, means nothing to them. Uh, so if you don't actually know about something, you can't desire it. You can't fear it. And he says in this in this passage that, that that natural human beings don't know about death. In the state of nature, human beings were not advanced enough to actually understand death, to actually know about it. Therefore, they didn't fear it because again, you can't fear something that you don't actually know about. So he says, on the one thing, on the one hand, thinking is dependent on feeling. We seek to know only because we desire to enjoy. So, so we, we try to understand things, we try to think about things only to, because, because we, we desire to get something. But again, at the same time, feeling is also dependent on thinking. Um, we, we, we desire something only because we know about it, only because it seems possible, and again, only because we know that it exists. Um, so he says, you know, there, there's really very little knowledge of anything in the state of nature because it's so simple. All that they know is the simple natural world, and therefore they have some very, very basic desires, some very, very basic emotions, desires for food, for drink, for rest, and occasionally for sex. And Rousseau says, that's it. 
and without any experience of anything else, without any knowledge of anything else, they wouldn't desire anything else, and therefore their passions would remain extremely simple and, in a sense, relatively uh, uh, peaceful. Um, and again, he says, at this point, even even death is is not even something that they're aware of, not something that that they're that they're you know worried about, afraid of, uh, dreading or anything like that. Uh, he says, you know, it's, it's just very, very simple in that way. So he says, so, so how do they ever get out of that condition? And, and he starts to think about, you know, how that would have happened. He, t he thinks about, talks about how difficult it would have been for human beings to arrive at just even the most basic forms of knowledge. And he says it would have been extremely difficult for them to, for any individual to have figured this out, and even more difficult for them to pass it along to somebody else, because, again, there was no speech and there was no reason to communicate with anyone. So he says it must have been so difficult for society to develop at all, uh, or for human beings to develop at all. Um, and he says he uses fire as an example, also uses property as an example. Why would anybody have bothered to, if, if you say, uh, as Locke does, that property comes from simply mixing your own labor, something that is your own, your, your body, with, with nature in the form of, so, so you mix something that is your own, your body, in the form of your own physical labor, with nature and therefore what the, the product even if it's just you know so if you plow a field and plant something that you, what grows is is your own property Locke says because you've it's the product of your own labor you've mixed your labor your own body with with the natural world and you've produced something which belongs to you then because of because of you know your 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 use of your own labor but Rousseau says, why would anybody ever do that in the state of nature? Even if they could somehow figure out agriculture, even if they could somehow figure out planting things and harvesting them, which, which Rousseau will go on to say, it must have been very, very difficult for them to ever even conceive of that, much less start to do it and, and understand it and so on. But he says, even if they somehow did do that, even if they did somehow understand it in the state of nature, why would anybody ever do that? The first person who comes along, the, the first animal, everybody would just come along and, and just eat whatever they wanted. And not because they were being unjust, but because in the state of nature there would be no property. Uh, so Rousseau says, you know, so many of these things, it, it's almost impossible to imagine. Where did language come from? Where did even, you know, use of fire come from? Where did property and, and agriculture and so on? Uh, where did these things come from? So he's, he's saying it's very difficult to figure all this out. And he focuses language. Where did language come from? How would it have become necessary? So again, he says, human beings are living in the state of nature, completely isolated, completely dispersed. Sometimes they see each other. Uh, occasionally they, they uh, get together for sex, but for the most part, they, they're, they're just out there running around in this big uh, primeval forest or plain or whatever exactly it is. Again, for, for Rousseau, the state of nature is, is a state of plenty, basically, so it's not as if they're, they're having to really fight for anything. Um, and and they, they have no real need uh, to, to speak to one another. As he says again, occasionally they, 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 they get together to procreate, but as, as he says, you know, the, the, the men and women, they, they, they didn't need, need words to say what they had to say to each other. Uh, that was all clear enough. And uh, beyond that, why would they, they didn't need to speak. They, they didn't need each other for anything. Everyone was basically self-sufficient. They could get their own food, get their own drink, sleep. They didn't need anybody for anything else. Therefore, where would language have ever come from? Where would the need to communicate ever have come from? Um, and he says, of course, today we might say, well, mothers teach their children, but he says, but that doesn't make any sense. In the state of nature, the mother, as the adult, would have been self-sufficient. She would not need language at all. The, 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 the child would be the one who needed language, and so therefore the, 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 the child would have to sort of figure it out on his own. The mother wouldn't teach the child. The, the child would have to somehow come up with language, and somehow the mother would have to understand what the child was saying. And Rousseau says, even if that somehow happened, even if even if the even if the child can somehow consistently indicate that he was hungry with a certain sound and thirsty with a certain sound and so on, Rousseau says that means there would be as many languages as there were speakers because every child would come up with his own language, his own system of sounds to to indicate these basic needs of hunger and thirst and fatigue and so on. So he says that that you, you can't explain nature that way, or you, you can't explain language that way. You can't say that, 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 that language arose because the mother taught the child, because why was the mother speaking to begin with? It doesn't make any sense. She wouldn't need to. And you can't say, well, then children devised their own language and somehow it spread because each child would devise its own language uh, to, to, to communicate with its mother. And again, then once it wandered off at the age of five or seven or something, then that's it. It doesn't need to talk anymore, so it would forget the language altogether. It would never use it again. So he says that, 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 that doesn't explain where languages come from. And then he says, but then he goes on, he says, so let us suppose that first difficulty overcome. How did languages become established? Let's just say that somehow people have figured out the idea of language. How do they actually establish language? How do they actually establish particular words? This word will mean this. 
Uh, so Rousseau says, here we meet a fresh difficulty, even worse than the previous one. For if men needed speech in order to learn to think, they need still more to know how to think in order to discover the art of speech. So he says, in other words, you can't think without words, but he says even more, you, can't, you, you, you need to understand how to think to even feel the need for words. So I mean, it's obviously saying something of a paradox. On the one hand, you can't think without words because you know a lot of what thinking is is, is using actual words, uh, thinking in concrete terms that, that is only made po made possible by words. Uh, so so thinking relies on words to be more than simply feelings, vague senses about things. And yet at the same time, he says without without abstract ideas, you don't or, or really just thinking generally, you don't have any need for words. Uh, you can teach somebody words, but if, if, if they don't, if, if they're not able to, to, to think in a kind of abstract way, they don't have any use for those words. They'll never say anything because they can't actually form those words into sentences, into thoughts. So he says, so, so what, wh how could any of this have, have happened? How could it ever have happened that on the one hand people started to think when they had no words, and yet why would they feel the need for words to devise language if they weren't already thinking? But that's impossible unless they already had words. But they would never have words unless they were already. So he says, you know, it's sort of a, it's just all very hard to, to figure out how any of this could have happened at all. Um, he says, you know, maybe there were some gestures and occasionally sounds. Then they would, you know, maybe point out predators or, or something else that, that was in the environment. They, you know, gestures would be the first way. But then those don't always work at night and so on. So maybe occasionally people came together, cooperated, or maybe even let's say that, let's say that they're that they're living together at this point. And they, they, they come up with certain words for certain things. Again, maybe maybe predators or something. But he says, how do they ever go beyond that? How do they ever go beyond those very simple names for particular objects to have any kind of abstract uh, thought or language? Uh, he kind of explains in, in, the, uh, in, the, in part two how this might have happened. Um, but again, so in, but again, he comes back and he comes back to the idea, in any case, however it happened, because obviously we have language now, the impossibility of figuring out how this happened, or, or the great difficulty of imagining people in the state of nature having language or speech at all, much less any kind of developed or, or complicated language or speech. Rousseau says, again, this is just another argument against the idea that, that in the state of nature people were coming up with covenants or contracts or abstract ideas about natural right. Rousseau says this just shows in the state of nature there would have been no language or maybe extremely simple language, a few words. And Rousseau says therefore, again, people were not making covenants in the state of nature, they were not making contracts, they were not uh, coming to formulate natural law. Whatever was going on in the state of nature, and again, therefore, Rousseau says whatever natural law is has to be something much simpler than, 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 than what you would communicate with, with abstract thought and, and, and uh, abstract developed uh, uh, language. Uh, so he goes on again, more on language, makes some interesting points. He says, you know, it would have developed very slowly. Uh, there would have been no general concepts or terms because, again, they would have started by naming very specific things. And then that, that great leap, he says, would have been actually coming up with, with abstract ideas, but even just, just very general terms. So, in other words, you may have, you may have come up with, uh, with, with a name for a particular thing, and yet Rousseau says there, there would be a tendency to, to every time that you see that, so if you, if you name something a bear, Every time you see a bear, you would give it a different name because you wouldn't, uh, Rousseau says, even that, you know, if you see a bear, maybe you're, you're scared, you cry out or something and run away, and maybe that becomes a symbol just when you cry in, in a frightened way, people know there, there's a predator nearby. But Rousseau says, how do you ever go beyond the feeling of that's a predator and some feeling of fear, which you indicate through a particular kind of cry, a particular tone of voice in, 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 in the cry that you let out? Rousseau says that, that that next step of actually making that kind of abstract uh, concept of predator or bear or, or whatever it is, a, a general concept of this isn't just a moment of fright and therefore run away, but we can actually identify what that is in some kind of general universal abstract way, Rousseau says, again, that would have been extremely difficult. How would they ever have made that have made that conceptual leap to actually start using even just very basic concepts like bear or predator or, or, or tree or something like that. Um, <coughs> he says the, these general abstract ideas are basically impossible without language. Uh, as he says, you know, try to draw in your mind the picture of a tree in general. He says you can never do it. You'll always imagine, you'll always draw or imagine a particular kind of tree. It'll be tall or short. It'll be leafy or it'll have no leaves or it'll have a few leaves. It'll be a particular kind of tree. So Rousseau says again, you know, how did these general ideas come from? Where, where did they come from without language? How would the concept of, 
a tree as opposed to you know a, a particular thing how did the concepts of trees in general or bears or tigers or you know storms or, or or whatever where did these ideas come from they would require language and they would require relatively developed language so again he says it's very hard to imagine any of this in the state of nature um, and he says when they finally did that um, he said so at first they, 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 they couldn't they, they couldn't conceive of the idea of general terms of species of, of, of genera of, of you know uh, categories of things again bears tigers whatever therefore they they named each one individually but then he says once once they finally made that jump when they finally crossed over uh, and, and came to understand okay there are general concepts general terms we can talk about bears we can talk about tigers he says that then he goes on he says on page 96 just as they must at first have produced too great a multiplicity of nouns of individuals for lack of knowledge of genera and species they must afterwards have produced too few genera and species for want of discriminating between the differences in things. So he says at first they must have named each thing individually. Uh, and, and each thing they, 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 they thought was a complete uh, uh, individual because they didn't understand the, the concept of species or of, of generic groups. So every new thing that they saw they would give a new name. And then once they made that, 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 that leap, that next step, and understood uh, the idea of a species, the idea of a general category, then he says they must have lumped everything into this one general category. So every predator was a bear. Uh, because, you know, they're making these distinctions between a bear and a tiger and a lion and, you know, a wolf or whatever, that was all kind of unnecessary. And again, they didn't quite figure it out yet. Uh, they, they, they didn't see the need, and they just weren't able to fully understand yet, okay, there are actually differences within these groups. Not everything is just part of this one big group. There are actually different groups here. There, there are different species here. So Rousseau says it must have been a very long time before they got to that point. Um, and so again, you know, goes on, talks about how difficult it must have been to invent language, uh, to spread it, to communicate it. And then he sort of sums up that part of it, that, that part of the argument by saying, whatever these origins may be, we see at least from the small pains, or in, in other words, the small efforts, the fact that it hasn't made any efforts, which nature has taken to unite man through mutual needs or to facilitate the use of speech, how little she has prepared their sociability and how little she has contributed to what they have done to establish bonds amongst them, among themselves. So he says, you know, wherever language comes from, let's set aside this problem, this, this question. Wherever language comes from, whatever the origin of language and speech is, speech is he says, we see that nature did almost nothing to, to unite human beings through mutual needs, because Rousseau says, naturally, adults at least need nothing from each other. Obviously, you could disagree. I mean, Aristotle would disagree and say, well, actually, they, 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 there is a kind of natural sociability. Human beings want to live together. They, they do have needs, intellectual needs. Uh, needs for, for, for developing certain human capacities. Rousseau clearly, like Hobbes, rejecting all of that. Rousseau says, you know, human beings are by nature uh, asocial. They, they don't need anything from other people. They certainly don't need community or political activity or, or to practice virtue with one another. Uh, so he says, you know, you can see by, by the fact that nature did almost nothing to create mutual needs or to facilitate the use of speech, to make speech inherent or to make it necessary or anything like that. So Rousseau says, you see by nature human beings are not sociable. Uh, they, 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 they're not naturally drawn to one another. Again, they're not drawn to harm one another, but, but they're not drawn to, to connect with one another, uh, to, to, co to cooperate, to live together in any kind of permanent way. Um, so he goes on, he says, I know we are constantly being told that nothing is more miserable than man in the state of nature. Now, I, I would be pleased to have it explained to me what kind of misery can be that of a free being whose heart is at peace and whose body is in health. So he says, you know, in other words, the, the, the human being in the state of nature is free. He's, 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 not, uh, he's not enslaved in any way. He's completely free. His heart is at peace because he doesn't know any, any real fear. Uh, he, he doesn't know about death. As Rousseau has said, he can take care of himself uh, when, when he encounters other animals, even dangerous animals. Uh, his body is in health. He's running around all the time, eating natural foods, not eating too much. So he basically says, what is so miserable about that? The natural human, uh, human beings in the state of nature, natural humanity, they don't have the luxuries that we have, but those luxuries just make us soft. And he'll go on and say, and we actually come to take them for granted, and therefore they actually, the, the, the loss of them causes us more pain than we ever get enjoyment through having them. Uh, so he says there's, there's really nothing to any of that. Uh, and he says, again, all these things that, that we think are good, they've just made us soft. And yes, they don't exist in the state of nature, but that doesn't make human beings in the state of nature unhappy. It doesn't make them, uh, they're not actually lacking or missing anything.
Um, they're, they're, they're free, they're, their hearts are content because they, they don't desire anything that they can't have, and their body is in health. So he says, yes, they're out there, they're eating acorns, they're sleeping under trees, but they're actually happier that way than we are in society because in many ways uh, all of the reasons why society makes us happy, which we'll get into in part two in particular. Um, but again, so he's sort of coming here and saying, you know, that, that uh, life of human beings in the state of nature is in fact better, happier uh, than, than the, the life of human beings uh, in society. He'll develop this um, uh, a little bit more in this, in this as, as the, uh, in these final few pages of, of part one.